Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks, thanks for coming. This is my first talk in Europython. This is my first time attendee as a Europython speaker. And also, this is my first English talk. So, yeah, it's lots of first times. So, let's see how it goes. Thank you so much for coming. I know this is a really bad hour. We already have a quite good uh, coffee. Uh, and this time we call in Spain the siesta time, so thanks for checking in. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be with you. So we are going to talk about this topic, RPA, TDD, and embedded. Maybe you know those of the, some of those words. If not, don't worry, I'm going to explain it. My idea or my intention is this to be as much clear as possible because I want this to be really beginner friendly. So for all of you that maybe are new to Python or even new to testing itself, I hope this is useful to you. Some things uh, about me. Uh, my name is Javi. I'm from Spain. Uh, I'm working currently at Geodab. Thanks to them, I have some free days to come here and give this talk. So, so grateful. I'm working as an embedded uh, firmware engineer. Um, I'm the organizer of the PyCon conferences from the 2022 and 2024. And also, I'm the Python Spain president elected this year. So, yep. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, what's all about? Also, all those fancy images, thanks to DALI 3. <laughs> what's all about? Okay, we're going to go through all the TDD thing explaining why testing is important and trying to introduce you into a framework that, in my opinion, it's awesome for testing because it allows everyone to start doing any kind of test without knowledge of Python. So first thing first, we're going to first talk about raw framework, which looks like that. This is the language itself. Then we are going to introduce uh, some Expected, sorry. <laughs> we are going to introduce then the board that we are going to play a little bit with it. This is an ASP8266 uh, board, and we are trying to glue everything together. How? With raw framework. Seems feasible, so let's see how. First, we need to introduce some terms, the, those three terms that maybe some of you are not aware of them. The first one is RPA, which stands for Robotic Process Automation that it's basically, uh, it assumes that the environment that you're working at is not controlled by you. So it expects that the application, or in this case the test, or the automation that you are writing, it expects that automation to prepare and set up the whole environment because it assumes that the computer that you're going to run the tests is not controlled by you, so you have no control of it. The next terminology is TDD, which stands for Test Drive and Development. And it's a design pattern in which you define an application and your API by writing first the tests that are going to validate that application. Seems a little bit complicated or slightly different, but the power of TDD is that when your application is ready, you already have the tests, so you are 100% sure that you are covering all your requirements. So that's great. And finally, the embedded world, which is suffering, suffering, and lots of suffering. There are lots of things that can go wrong. It's quite easy that you start working with your board, and then you start seeing some smoke, smells rare. Yeah, you know what happened there. So embedded world is suffering in general, from the design to also writing the finger. So that's why it's so important to test it well and have very well-defined tests. How are we going to do that with raw framework? Some hints about raw framework. It's an open source automation framework. It has lots of power uh, behind it, but it mainly allows you to automate both tests and tasks. It can be used also for automating tasks. Uh, for me, the most important thing about it is that it's human-friendly syntax. You write the test exactly the same way as you would write like your text, like writing a book, the same way. And finally, it integrates fully with other automation and languages. It works 100% compatible with Python, but it can work also with Java, with C, and other frameworks and languages. It's quite powerful, and it's been used by lots of companies like Cisco or even Microsoft. First thing first, 
I'm going to try to explain why embedded testing is sometimes a mess and it's difficult. I'm going to introduce just a little bit of C code. Maybe this is the first time that you're seeing C code. It's a little bit horrendous, I know, I know, but it does the thing that it needs to do. What's the problem with unit testing? With unit testing for embedded application or for C application mostly, you, the problem is that you have to define your tests as part of the application and you need to switch applications so you have your main application but then the test is another application that it's checking your application. So it's such a pain. And the problem with that is that we have these pieces of code wrapped inside these if dev instructions that are basically dynamically compiled code. This code may exist or may not exist. May not exist. So it changes and it's, it's hard sometimes. The problem with this is that it works. It works really well, but you are not properly or 100% testing your final application. You are changing the code of your application to test the application. So strictly speaking, it's not testing the application itself. And then we have the black box or the integration testing, where we have our board right there, and we need to connect it with all the other nodes, devices, and things, because basically an embedded system it, by definition, it's a system that works inside other systems. So it needs to communicate, for example, with a server. It needs to gather some data and publish it to a topic in MQTT, which is a protocol, a communication protocol. So this second testing is the most usual one where you test your whole setup with your whole uh, board. So that's the second one. This is the one that we're going to try to automatize with our framework. So, before going into that, I'm going to briefly explain a robot framework with some examples that maybe are like near to you, uh, using an HTTP REST API, which I think for sure you will know, but I will explain it uh, otherwise. So first, we are going to define uh, a database. This is the database. We have a robot factory, and in that robot factory, we have to store the names of the robots and also some of their status. So you for sure may already know that, but we have some crude operations like insert a, a new robot there. We have the option to get robots and things like that, okay? Uh, this is the unit testing part. We are going to unit test this API directly from Robo Framework and explain the process uh, step by step. Uh, those are the tests, like a little bit small. Sorry about that. I, mean, I have to say, I have an excuse. I have just bought this clicker thing. Oh, sorry. I have just bought this clicker thing, and it's quite cool, eh? isn't it? So I, I really like to try that, so sorry. <laughs> it's small on purpose. <laughs> but yeah, we have the test here, but we are going to go step by step explaining how our framework test is constructed. First, we have the setting, the setting section, which is right there. In the settings section, we define everything related to our suit. In this case, we have the documentation, which is going then to be auto-generated, and everyone knows what is this suit testing. Then we have some libraries. The first library, the database library, allows us to access database information, directly make SQL queries, like, okay, give me these robots or check that this field exists. Then the second library is not a library itself. This is our Python file, the one that we are going to try to test. Remember, we have all those functions, the insert robot, check robot, delete robot. So we are going to test those functions. And then here we have some environment setup that basically are going to create some dummy data that we are going to later use to verify that everything is in there, okay? Next, we have the test cases themselves. The test cases have that appearance. We have first the, t the test case name, the robot in this case, robot insertion, robot exist, robot deletion. We have some metadata. In this case, we have all, only documentation, but we, we can include some other things, like we can tag the tests to be able to filter them out and things like that. And the powerful thing is that you can actually read the test. This one, maybe it's quite difficult or different because we have a SQL query directly embedded into that, but we will get into that in a moment. And maybe you may ask, like, where is the Python function? Like, you don't see any Python call there. 
you don't see the class that we have defined previously, there's a trick. It's there. This insert robot first, right here, that's our call. What happens with robot framework? It intends to be readable, always. So when you have a function name, the underscores are replaced by spaces, and then every first letter is capitalized. So that insert robot right there is underneath our insert robot call, the same that we have defined in the API. But that way is way more readable. And those things right there are the first argument, the robot name that we are going to insert, and the second argument, which is the status of the robot. We commit the changes, and then we check that the SQL query actually returns the robot name that we have just inserted, okay? The same here, the same thing before. We insert a default robot, and we verify that that robot exists. So, seems readable enough for the moment. And this is the running. You run it on the terminal, robot uh, run test units, and this is the output. Now, what about integration testing? Because we've been testing only the database, but we, I said previously that we are going to have a full HTTP REST API, so how do we test that? Okay, this is the API that we have defined. For sure you will know Fast API, at least because it's been mentioned throughout all these past days like 100 times every day, so this is the 101. This is the Fast API thing that is interfacing our database. And with robot, we are going to test all of these methods here. And this is the test. I know, it's a little bit small. <laughs> but it's only for the clicker thing. <laughs> so the same as before, we define our settings, the thing that we are going to test, how to set up, how to create everything. In this case, we have the documentation. It's important to have documentation of the test case, of the test suite, because if you are going to check it after a month, at least you know what's going on here. We have some resource thing that I'll go into it a little bit later, and some setup things that are the same as before. It's are creating some dummy data for the database to have everything ready for whenever we want to test it. Then we have the tests themselves. Exactly as before, we have, in this case, a way to list robots. We have the one API call to get the root robot, and this is basically performing the, some HTTP requests underneath. Like, if you have a look at the line 15, we have get on session, we have a session object, which who knows what's that, and we get the robot paths, and we expect the status to 100. So if everything goes fine, we get a response. We have to evaluate who knows what's that robot as a JSON thing, and then compare the JSON with the expected output, and it should be equal. So this is readable, I mean, have you seen that, that thing below, like get from dictionary data, get all those things, what the heck is the session object, what's that JSON thing, what's going on? I mean, I know, I promise you, this is gonna be readable, but this is not that readable at all. Um, I'm not a scammer. This has, of course, some tricks, because if not, it will be clickbait. Uh, <laughs> The damn small pictures, I think this joke has gone too far. Okay, one of the powerful things of row framework are the resources file. What's a resource file? It's almost exactly the same as a test case file, but we define things that are common to all the test cases. In this case, as before, we have the settings with the documentation, some libraries to, for example, perform requests, access database, spawn processes, whatever, up to you. And then we have some variables which define a static data that it's available for us throughout the execution of the test, okay? But the powerful thing of the resource files are the keywords. So we can grab all this shitty code, that mess that we have previously into beautiful keywords that basically translate the test previously to this thing. So for example, to list all the robots, now we only need to API get robots as JSON and then just simply compare that the return answer is exactly the same as the one that we expect. Or for example, for verifying the robot ID matches, all those get from dictionary crappy thing that was underneath are the, simply those two lines. We get the robot as JSON and then 
we match or we make sure that the status of the robot is the one that we expect to be. And this is way more simpler and easier to read. But what if, what if we used 100% of our brains? What if we define our keywords with Python? Because remember, as I said previously, robot framework is 100% compatible with Python. So we can define our keywords in a Python class. And in this case here, we're using the well-known request library to perform all the heavy job underneath. And we simply define Python API get with a path and expected status and Python API post. And what we have, boom, your tests simplified, writing, written and running with Python. And we have the same keywords here. We have the Python API get, we have the Python API post, and everything is simplified. That's one of the key features of Robo Framework. If there's no library for it, just simply use Python. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's already lots of libraries right there. And then we get these fancy logs. These fancy logs basically have all the information on what has happened in the test, like all the, the setup things, the keywords, the login that has gone underneath. And this is quite powerful, but only talking about the logs would be at least a workshop. So I'm going to pass right quickly over it. So that's raw framework. That's like the overall look of it. And now let's introduce the hardware. Let's see how can we combine all these keyword fancy things with the hardware. This is the board we are going to test. As I said before, the ESP8266. It's quite a simple board. And we have some sensors connected, the sound sensor. We have some temperature and humidity sensor. And finally, a light sensor. This board I, was developed by me like during the COVID pandemic. And it serves for the push post to detect how many people are in a room. Combining all the sensors, the lectures, it's quite possible to know if there are too many people in a room. So for the COVID thing, made a lot of sense. What are our goals? What are we trying to test? What are we trying to verify? The first thing, it's quite important. We need to load a known firmware to the board because uh, aside from Python applications, when you want to run something in an embedded device, you have to actually write it into the device. And every time you update the code, you need to fully write it again from the beginning. I know it's a pen, but it's the way it works. There are some means to avoid that, but yeah, it's difficult. Sorry. Oh. OK, the next thing that we need to ensure is that we can communicate through the UART. What's the UART? UART stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. OK, I, I'm exactly the same as before. What's that? It's simply communication with the device. It's uh, the USB cable that we've seen before. That USB cable is capable of sending and receiving data from the board. So, but we want to make fancy names. All that is because of the telecommunications engineer. They really like the acronyms. So all the acronyms are because of telecommunications engineer. They have acronyms of acronyms and nested acronyms inside an acronym. So, all because of the effort. So yeah, send commands, receive response. This is basically what we want and what we are trying to do. Finally, we are going to validate all that data against an MQTT server, which is basically a place where one can publish messages and other boards, people there can subscribe to those messages. Like I say, hey, this room is way too crowded. And there is a subscriber that receives that message and decides to do anything or to publish some data or to have some operations. So that's basically very briefly explained an MQTT server. Then we need to catch potential uh, exceptions because the same way as in Python we can have exceptions, in embedded devices we can have exceptions because we have an invalid instruction, because we have run out of heap or of stack. And finally, of course, we need to be able to set up and tear down the whole environment for the board to work and always start from a known state. Okay? Right. Okay, this is the setup function that we are going to use to prepare everything to load the firmware into the board. And we are going to go step by step to see what's going on underneath. We have here defined available device 
as I said before, some fancy keywords to basically look for where is the device connected to our computer. And if you have a look at it underneath, it's basically some process. In this case, it's calling Platformio, which is a hardware handling tool, device list, we get the output as a JSON. But as I said, the keywords serve to hide all those things. We don't need to know that. We only need to find a viable device and load firmware into the device. Second, we create the serial session. We are using, in this case, a Telnet, which is a communication protocol, and Robo Framework has native support for it. So, same as before, we hide everything in a keyword and we simply have create serial session. Underneath, what's doing all that? I don't care. Simply, I don't care. I know that after that keyword succeeds, I have a fully available serial connection. We could use some other libraries like PyExpect or uh, uh, I missed it, uh, PySerial, sorry, but in this case we are using the native implementation of RoboFrameWork. We create the MQTT server and also we start an access point because the only way the board has to communicate with, inter the, with the internet is through a Wi-Fi access point. So in this case, we have our access point in the computers and we start MQTT server with a Docker daemon underneath. As I said before, we don't care about the implementation. And finally, we prepare the board. All that was prepared in the environment, and now we need to set up the board. What's the setup of the board? First, we need the board to connect to the Wi-Fi, and later, we need the board to connect to the MQTT server. And this is as simple as we wait until a prompt. We have defined what's a prompt, so we are waiting basically for a specific character appearing in the board and we send these commands. We fit set SSID, we set, we fit set password, and all that information. And finally, we wait until the board connects to the Wi-Fi. The MQTT setup, the same. We send some commands, and we expect a message to arrive in the MQTT server, so that way we know that the board is already connected and has connectivity with MQTT. Same. Remember, one of our goals was detecting errors in the board. How we detect errors? We detect errors with regular expressions. We know that errors that are controlled from our side have this syntax. They have an error and a message. Then we simply check for that in the output of the serial device. And then we can use that also in a test case. We can have a test case like that where we expect this error to happen, simply. How do we then catch exceptions? The same way, we look uh, here for the exception and then a number. Why? Because exceptions are that thing, that pretty funny thing that no one is able to read, but at least you need to detect it in order to try to solve it. So as you can see here, we have the exception and the number, and we are looking for this. If that's in the output, then the board has reset, an exception has occurred. And these are the tests. The tests are checking that the sensor data is the one that we expect. We are using for that a variable file, which is defined here, that it's basically, in this case, some Python dictionary with all the sensors that we have, the ranges of that sensors, and we are using all that in several framework to verify that the data that we are reading First, is correct, and second, is the value that we are expecting. Either if we write, because this board allows like writing a data to verify that everything goes fine, or that it's in the range that we have defined. And also we have some threshold here to verify that if we set a value that it's above the threshold, fails. The same. This is uh, testing the sensor data, we verify the internals, this is writing a command, reading the data and verifying that that data appears in the MQTT server. And this is like the COVID-related thing, where if we write some data that it's above the threshold, we should receive some events. Like, for example, if the temperature here is above 30 degrees, then we should have an event that it says, okay, this room is probably too crowded. Or if the light sensor right here is above 600 looks, then very probably there are people in the room. So those are events that we have defined and that we are checking against the MQTT server. But as you can have a look at it here, 
is quite simple, the test. We have the template, which is basically simulating an event, which means writing to the board, receiving data, data, and verifying that everything goes fine. The keywords underneath, I'm not going to explain them because it's like maybe so too much detail. And as a bonus, you can, of course, generate the docs of all the keywords that you define, so it's pretty accessible to all of them. And how the test looks like, how it's a real execution of raw framework. In this case, I introduced some uh, traces to see what's happening, because if not, it's like quite quiet. Uh, but here, you can see we are loading the firmware once we have found the device. Then you will see that we start the MQT server, we start the Wi-Fi, we start some things, and it should be start to run in tests in a moment. So, conclusions. What's the thing about raw framework? What's the power of raw framework? It's super easy to write tests. I know there are some crappy things underneath, but if you abstract everything to keywords, it's, it's quite accessible. You can write the tests as you want them to be read. And it's as simple as that. And also it supports, maybe you know that, the jerking style, so you can write text, test, sorry, literally as if they were data, if they were text. So simply write them, read them, and everyone in your company, in your business, can start doing tests, can start working on some uh, APIs for you. And you already, you will have already some test base to test everything. So what are you waiting for? Go play with your robots. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, give a round of applause again to uh, Javier. So now there will be like a Q and A section. So if people have some question, please go to the mic and uh, you can ask. There are like two, three minutes only now, so please be quick. Any questions? I have a question for you, if you don't have any. Was it really beginner friendly, or maybe it was complicated or more complicated than you may expect on some things? How can I improve this talk? <laughs> okay, less code. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thanks for your talk. It was interesting to see how others are doing this. Um, we are also testing hardware, and we're using PyTest. Did you also look into that, or did you evaluate, or was it already there? Yeah, we we work lots with PyTest, but the problem with PyTest is that it's not accessible to everyone, at least in terms in the terms that we are trying to make it really accessible. Like, we are pushing really hard to have tests that are can be read the same way as you read a book. So the problem with PyTest is that at some point, although it's Python, has some initial knowledge that everyone needs to go over. So if, let's say, I want some guys or some people from the production engineering or from the hardware design team to write the tests that should verify that the hardware is working, and maybe they don't know Python, this is a great entry point because they will already have lots of keywords with some behaviors and they can focus only on writing the tests and not on understanding the language and the framework. Cool, um, quick, quick question. Um, have you come across the concept, and is that what you were describing, the using the um, Three Amigos style of having it where BDD has three stakeholders, which are the programmer, the yeah. product owner, and yeah, where someone else. <laughs> one of the problems, for example, that we have in the company is that, but I think it happens everywhere, uh, marketing people really want to sell lots of things. That's great, because it's the money income. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they're trying to sell things that are almost impossible to build. And those for this thing are our main stakeholders and shareholders. Why? Because they already know, like, 
what are the potential capabilities of the things that we can do. So if they have like a great idea, they can first write that idea in a formalized way with the keywords, with the tests, and if that's feasible, then the idea is possible. So we don't need to start fighting with them like, why are you doing that? It's literally impossible to make this board fly. So why are you doing that? So that's our main stakeholder. So if you have more doubts, we can always go to speaker like for the next breaks. So there will be a break start for five minutes now. So uh, again, maybe you can give a round of applause and... Uh... Thank you.